A couple of days ago after recording this video, the production of the LX platform officially ended. The LX platform was the basis for the Challenger, Charger, and 300 since 2004. I believe the Challenger and Charger were on the platform come, I think, 2008. The final model to roll off the assembly line was at the Stellantis factory in Brampton, Ontario. It was a 2023 Challenger SRT Demon 170 in black. To kind of honor the end of this amazing platform, in my opinion, I wanted to take a trip down memory lane and talk about the second gen Dodge Challenger. Man, is this one of the most forgotten Challengers and just cars in general. I'm going to go into great depth on the second gen Challenger that was in production from 1978 until 1983. You're not going to want to miss this video. It is for sure one of my most interesting videos of all time. The first gen Dodge Challenger was and still is an all time beast. You see one of these on the road and you cannot help but stare at it. Or if you're at a car show, you always make your way towards one. These Challengers back in 1970 were an absolute game changer. Of course, there was the Javelin and Rebel from AMC, Chevelle SS and GSX from GM, Mustang and Torino from Ford, and a whole bunch more. Just a completely different decade for automotive companies at the time. All during the Great Plymouth Sale. Well, it wouldn't be long before the government and emission regulations got involved and so things changed drastically. Imports were definitely impacting the domestic market in the late 70s. They were just so much more efficient than the domestic cars for consumers. And four years later, after the demise of the first generation, the Dodge Challenger name was back. Just now, it was a rebadged Mitsubishi Galant. Challenger, a new and very special import from Dodge. The first gen was marketed towards being that tough American beast. The second gen, on the other hand, was actually marketed as a luxury coupe. Base price was over $2,000 more than a Dodge Aspen Coupe, another possible option for consumers until 1980. Base price for a 78 was $5,600, and come 83, the base price jumped up to $8,300. I remember my first impressions when I saw this car. I was like, this, this is a Dodge Challenger? What happened to the big muscular car that I used to know? There's no way that this thing can fit any 440 or 360. And you were absolutely correct. These Challengers had no V8s, but they did have rear wheel drive, something the Celica did not have. I feel like that is a very underrated aspect of the second gens. At first glance, or just even knowing it was a captive import, I would immediately assume it's front wheel. They also came standard with a 5-speed manual, or a 3-speed auto was optional. These Challengers had the option of two engines, a 1.6 liter good for 77 horsepower, which came standard initially, and a 2.6 Hemi 4-cylinder good for 105 horsepower. Two things that I need to bring up with the, I guess, better engine. First, yes, it is a Hemi motor. Nothing like what we are used to today or even back then, but it does feature hemispherical combustion. Second, 105 horsepower for a four cylinder is not bad at all for the time. Zero to 60 in around 10 seconds. Remember that these manufacturers weren't really using turbochargers all that much, especially in the late 70s and early 80s. I will reconnect with the turbos of the early 80s later in the video. I guess one question that many of you may be thinking is, why did Chrysler do this? Why was this the new Challenger? It's not like Chrysler didn't have any V8s at the time. They still used them in the R-body cars. Those had 318s in them, and police interceptors mainly got a 360. So it's not like they had to develop an entirely new engine. They easily could have used the older motors from the first gens as well, and just made some tweaks to them. Chrysler would be stupid to put a giant V8 in these. Remember, gas prices are on the rise. Consumers didn't want a gas guzzler. I should provide some context as well. Chrysler, compared to Ford and GM, was struggling the most during this time. They for sure had the least amount of money. I mean, they were bailed out by the government in 1980. So Chrysler turned to Mitsubishi to be more competitive with not only the imports, but also the domestic market. And they had been working with Mitsubishi starting in 71 with the Dodge and Plymouth Colt. Fast forward to 1978, they essentially teamed up again and created another captive import, along with the newly styled Colt and Dodge D50 Ram pickup. 
I think I want to make an entirely different video on that D50 RAM. I think it's really cool and they actually had some interesting, bizarre additions with it. So possibly for the future. Also, Chrysler wasn't embarrassed or tried hiding the fact that they were working with Japan. They actually promoted it. The anti-shock sticker on Challenger and Sapporo imported only for Dodge and Plymouth. These road handling high-tech imports deliver a lot of car for the money. Like it or not, this is what Chrysler needed to do. Ford had the Pinto, GM with their Vega, and of course AMC with their Gremlin. Everyone was transitioning out of that muscle car craze. I'm not saying I like it. I think we can all agree the muscle cars from the late 60s to the early 70s were amazing. Just the American manufacturers were walking in the import's shadow. Dodge's brochure reads, It's a challenge that demands a new sophistication to match the changing times in which we live and drive. I would go as far as to say that Mitsubishi was one of the reasons that Chrysler was able to stay afloat during this time. I'm not saying it's the sole reason, but I think they definitely contributed. Which may sound crazy, but I personally think it's the truth. They supplied them with several efficient motors and drivelines that were super competitive. However, that is not to say the Challenger was a success by any means. They actually sold pretty badly. If we include the Plymouth Sapporo, which was a more simple Challenger, you could say, they typically sold around 20 to 25,000 units combined per year. That is not good at all. The Monza over at GM would sell over 100,000 units per year alone. And if I want to stay in the heat of the conversation, these cars were absolute rust buckets, as most cars of this era were, especially if they were Japanese. They just used thin, poorly protected steel. Also, I don't think they look the best, but they definitely are not ugly. For 1981, the Challenger underwent some noticeable changes to the exterior, specifically the front and rear end. I personally think those later models look better. I'm not 100% sure if creating a new name is super expensive or not, but Chrysler should have not given this captive import the Challenger name. Actually, Sapporo was a completely new name for Plymouth. Why didn't they give the Challenger a different name? I'm not saying this car is bad in any way. I think it was the right move for Chrysler at the time. But giving it the Challenger name was probably a market technique to get buyers to accept this change in the industry. I'm not a fan of that. I think that was a pretty bad move. So I was reading through the comments on my worst 80s cars from Chrysler video and, you know, I filtered to just read comments about the Challenger. I had this car as a separate entry in that video. And after reading around 35 comments specifically talking about this car, all from people that were around during the time and even by people who actually owned the car, 90% of the comments were positive in regard to the Challenger. So I was definitely proven wrong. Now there are some things that still set me off about the second gen, but for the most part, I now understand the situation more. And maybe you do too. Maybe I convinced you or taught you something completely new. So I mentioned earlier about the turbochargers in the late 80s. Well, that is the reason why the Challenger ended production. Chrysler wanted to focus more on other platforms as well. The Charger was a far better option, and if you had a little more money than the Daytona, and if you had even more money than the Laser. These cars, in my opinion, were a lot better. I'm mainly referring to the Shelby Chargers and Daytona Zs. The Chrysler 2.2 was adjusted many times, and just a year after the demise of the Challenger, this motor was making 142 horsepower with its debut, with the Turbo 1. If you wanted something a little more different, then even the Dodge Omni GLH featured these motors. It was just a little too late for the Challenger. Turbochargers were the new thing. Ford with their Turbo EXP, Mustang, and Thunderbird, and Chevy with their Turbo Regals, Monte Carlos, and even Trans Ams, things were just starting to change in the car world. Of course, the four markets with their turbo cars as well. I feel like I should expand outside the domestic market here and there. My knowledge especially of European cars is not all that good, because they too have some really competitive cars that could honestly run circles around many domestic cars in many different categories. That is going to wrap up the second gen Dodge Challenger. In all, it was the right move by Chrysler. They did what they needed to do to honestly stay afloat. I mean, that bailout definitely gave them a second chance as well. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. I'm wishing you all a happy new year. Maybe you get your dream car or get that engine swap finished or just your daily continues to run well. There's going to be some upgrades to the channel for next year and I can't wait to continue to grow. 
Thank you all, especially to those who continue to support the channel and me as a person. You guys are awesome. You all know your car stuff really well, and you don't have to do the research like how I do, so it's really impressive. With that, I'm kicking off next year with a 90s video. It's about time that I incorporate the 90s. I haven't made a video about them in maybe one or two months. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy that. Thank you so much. Happy New Year.